Good morning, and welcome back to the Global Energy Institute's Energy Innovates webinar series, where we convene experts to discuss the innovation that's driving America's energy future. This morning, we're discussing infrastructure and technology foundations for CCUS and the hydrogen economy. And we're excited to be joined by government and business leaders that will help us understand the important technology and policy issues facing development and growth of two of the most promising climate solutions available to us as we chart the path to a net zero economy. First, however, I'd like to briefly set the scene. As you recall, in September of last year, we hosted a webinar titled Blueprint for the Hydrogen Economy that aimed to highlight the need for the hydrogen R&D programs under consideration by Congress as part of the bipartisan infrastructure legislation. Six weeks after that, President Biden signed that bill into law, and the chamber was very proud to be a driving force behind its enactment. That law, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, provides a truly historic investment in energy and climate solutions, including more than $60 billion for the Department of Energy. Hydrogen and carbon capture, utilization, and sequestration are centerpieces of this effort, with multiple programs totaling roughly $15 billion. Now we get to the hard part, and that's implementing this legislation and ensuring that business and government are working closely on technology development in these areas while fostering a broader policy environment that maximizes investment. That's the focus of today's discussion. And to begin with, I want to turn it over to my colleague, Christopher Guth, to lead the discussion with our first speaker. Thanks, Marty. Now, I'm very happy to introduce Brad Crabtree, the Assistant Secretary for the Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management at the Department of Energy. Prior to coming to DOE, he served as the Vice President for Carbon Management at the Great Plains Institute, where he co-founded and directed the Carbon Capture Coalition, which works to advance carbon management technologies to meet climate goals, create high wage jobs, and support domestic energy and industrial production. At GPI, Brad also helped launch the bipartisan State Carbon Capture Work Group to foster deployment of carbon capture and CO2 transport infrastructure. And he led GPI's effort to establish the Industrial Innovation Initiative aimed at decarbonizing key industries. Good morning, Assistant Secretary Crabtree. Thank you very much for joining us. Brad? Mr. Crabtree? Can, can you hear me? How about now? Can you hear me now, Brad? Well, we're having some technical difficulties. Let's uh, let's try Plan B and move on to move back to Marty. Welcome back. We're always ready for a curveball now and then, and obviously had some technical difficulties there. But I uh, want to go ahead and, and, and move, move along with the program. And uh, I wanted to welcome Jeff Gustafson, who's Chevron's vice president of Lower Carbon Energies. It's a position he assumed in August of last year. Now, Jeff's role is to focus on lower carbon business prospects that had the potential to scale, including commercialization opportunities in hydrogen, carbon capture and offsets, and support for ongoing growth in biofuels. Now, Jeff previously served as the vice president of Chevron's North American Exploration and Production Company, and earlier served as president of Chevron Canada Limited. So he brings some great experience to the conversation here. So, Jeff, thanks for joining us. Good to be here. Can you hear me, Marty? I can. 
I can hear you fine. Right. Thank you. Right. So to begin with, I, I really, I'd just like you to take a few minutes and tell us about the business that you're now leading. I mean, what's you know, its history and its mission and how does the work that you lead to identify a new lower carbon businesses intersect with the efforts to lower emissions intensity of Chevron's traditional oil and gas production operations? Sure. And, and uh, I mean, first of all, great to great to be here. We, we stood up Chevron New Energies about a year ago. I think the announcement went out July uh, 20, 29th last summer. So we're approaching our one year anniversary. But it was built on work that went back uh, many years, even decades in some cases. And the New Energy's mission is to accelerate lower carbon solutions for customers inside the company, you know, our own operations as a customer base, uh, as well as third party customers. And I, we expect the third party business to grow uh, much more significantly than the internal business over, over time. You know, the, the purpose of uh, Chevron, the vision of Chevron is to provide affordable, reliable, ever cleaner energy that enables human progress. And we have two primary objectives as a company, deliver higher returns uh, for our shareholders and other stakeholders, and also lower the carbon intensity of the company and help with carbon solutions elsewhere. For, for lower carbon, we're, we're focused, New Energies is focused on not just decarbonizing our traditional oil and gas uh, businesses, upstream, midstream, and downstream, but we think it makes a lot of sense for us to embark and invest much more aggressively in creating new uh, lower carbon businesses. And, and there are a number of them, carbon capture, sequestration, storage, hydrogen business of renewable fuels, business with multiple products, natural gas products and other um, in, 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 in other products, uh, offsets business, a carbon offsets business. And finally, we're looking at a lot of emerging technologies such as geothermal, uh, a great opportunity for the, the United States. You know, all of these technologies we feel are critical to achieve any net zero uh, ambition uh, that's out there, including our own. Uh, these are deep decarbonization uh, technologies. Uh, and and we, we want to work with customers on opportunities in, in hard to abate, uh, difficult to electrify sectors. That's really the focus for us. And obviously, we're, we're one of those sectors. Uh, these are businesses. We're looking to, to add value uh, while we're abating carbon and helping with carbon solutions. And we pick these businesses very carefully because they all match up with existing capabilities, uh, existing assets that we have in the company, including CCUS assets and existing relationships with customers and other, and other stakeholders. Um, we, we've laid out ambitious spending plans, ambitious targets going out to 2030 and 2035. These, this will take a long time uh, to really build these businesses to, to scale. I think everybody recognizes that. And, and initially, Marty, we're focused on the US and Asia Pacific where we have a lot of uh, our, our traditional operations, but over time, I see this expanding to be a very global businesses in nature. Well, that's really helpful context. And as, as you say, well, this might be a new business unit within Chevron. It's certainly not a new activity or focus uh, for, for the company over the years. But but let's uh, let, let's dig into a few specific projects and technologies. So as I understand it, you've got about $10 billion of investment across a new energies portfolio. And so maybe you can highlight two or three of the projects or partnerships that you're most excited about. And uh, as you mentioned, you're, you're focused on uh, hard, hard to abate sectors. Um, that while well, yeah, they represent a significant portion of economy-wide emissions, there's still few readily available technology solutions. Yeah, it's hard to narrow it down to just a few. And the and the ten billion dollars which was announced, you know, we tripled our investment in the, in the lower carbon space over an eight-year period. That's from 2021 to 2020, 2028. You know, about two billion of that is earmarked for uh, decarbonization of our existing operations. Uh, the remainder, the $8 billion, is earmarked for growing these new low-carbon businesses. And, the, and the, the biggest step forward we've made so far is the acquisition of Renewable Energy Group, uh, which was just closed several weeks ago, you know, several billion dollar uh, acquisition that really takes our renewable fuels business to a, to a whole new level. But if I, if I dig into carbon capture and, and hydrogen, we're working over 100 different ideas you know, concepts around the world, you know, a, a few to highlight in May of this year, we announced we're entering uh, into an existing JV with Talos Energy and Carbonvert here right on the on the Gulf Coast. I'm based in 
in Houston to develop the Bayou Bend uh, CCUS hub, which is just offshore Jefferson County uh, here in, in Texas state waters. It's about a 40,000 uh, acre lease. Uh, we see several hundred million tons um, of CO2 storage potential. And obviously there are a lot of uh, industrial emissions, concentrated industrial emissions right in this area uh, onshore. This is the first and only offshore lease in the U.S. dedicated to CO2 sequestration, and we're very proud to enter into this joint venture. You know, this hub, that's a CCUS piece, but this hub, along with others that we see along the Gulf Coast, some we'll have an interest in, um, some we won't, um, will also enable the production of low carbon hydrogen. You know, using U.S. natural gas uh, from the Permian, from the Haynesville, from other basins here uh, in Texas or even elsewhere, uh, combined with CCUS to generate low carbon hydrogen, produce low carbon hydrogen for local consumption and even international demand. We can export uh, hydrogen in a number of ways. Uh, hydrogen's as much about enabling, you know, the production of it. And I just highlighted an opportunity here on the Gulf Coast, but it's also about the market and the system and the demand. How do you create uh, the, the hydrogen economy? So we have multiple partnerships on the demand side of the equation with Toyota, with uh, BNSF and Caterpillar. We're working with the Center for Marine Time uh, Decarbonization, with Cummins to, to work on the technology, the policy, um, you know, all the, the pieces that you need to, to actually make, um, to, to build a hydrogen uh, a economy. I, and I didn't cover anything specifically on technology, but all through these two projects, and of course on the demand side of the hydrogen equation, we're making a lot of technology investments in, in startups uh, outside of the company and technologies inside of the company to really make these businesses scale or help these businesses scale over time. Man, I think that's really helpful to hear about how the partnerships that you're building. And to me, it, it also shows the, the leadership that, that the private sector is taking. Yes, it certainly helps for the... It, it, definitely helps. We have to have government as a partner in here to help incentivize these things. But I was fortunate to be down. Uh, uh, like Jane Stricker is going to be on with us uh, you know, later on this program here with the Greater Houston Partnership and all the great work that's going on there to you know, pull together all the different uh, uh, folks in Houston to, you know, to, you know, to move these things forward. But uh, yeah, as I noted at the outset, you know, policy is a big part of what we need to, you know, to make progress here. Uh, and of course, we're hoping and expect that the historic funding made possible in the bipartisan infrastructure law uh, and this surge in private sector investment is going to accelerate adoption and scale up of hydrogen CCUS. Now, we hear we hear from members all the time about the need for clear policy signals in areas such as taxes, regulations, permitting, uh, all, all in order to you know, reduce uncertainty and the risks associated with investments in clean energy commercialization. Um, so, well, I know you're in Houston, but w what are your thoughts about what, what Congress and the executive branch should be focusing on to strengthen that policy environment and the incentives for innovation and, and capital investment in hydrogen and CCUS? And, and by the way, feel free what we, to tell us what we ought to avoid. Yeah, it, it's, it's critical for, for this. And, and we're investing, you know, the $10 billion dollars. Uh, and certainly the $8 billion to grow these new low carbon businesses, you know, is really predicated on a belief inside the company uh, that there, that the, the challenges associated with carbon are, are, are in climate change are, are real. And we need to do something uh, about that, but there'll be a partnership, a public private partnership in order to affect that. And that is important. That underpins almost everything that we're, that, that we're doing here. And it's not just solely, based on public support, but the combination of enough public support to start to get private industry to help de-risk some of these investments, which are incredibly risky and, and with lots of uncertainty, to get that private investment really going uh, at a much bigger scale than even what we see uh, today, that'll do two things. That will drive down uh, the costs uh, and advance uh, the technology. And uh, you can put one of, one of those in front of, front of the other, those two work uh, together. And then over time, uh, when you have uh, uh, advanced technology with lower costs, these businesses become much more viable and less uncertain with less risk and private industry can, um, can really take off and that policy support can, can attenuate over time. 
there are a, a lot of promising signs in the U.S. The U.S. is still in a in a in a leadership position here. The infrastructure law is a great example uh, of that. But we need more. I think we all recognize we're going to need more if we're really going to scale these businesses and really address uh, the issues associated with with climate change. I think there's I think of three big things that uh, the federal government, Congress can do to help. Uh, one is very simple: the messaging around this. Um, it, it's sometimes you know, mixed, and and I think we need to be very clear uh, about what what technologies are a part of the solution here and not too specific and narrow as you as you highlighted about you know these will work and and these will not we, we truly believe this is an all of the above um, approach that will help um, you know spur really strong partnership uh, you know private public 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 and uh, you know uh, public private I mean it, it's really partnerships across the board and helping to develop that policy and we want to work with uh, government in order to develop the right policies. On on that point, the second point, we need well-designed climate policy. You know, it needs to to take a global perspective. It needs to be focused on research and innovation. It needs to be balanced and measured. And we need to be transparent about the costs associated uh, with this. For from a Chevron standpoint, we support an economy-wide price on carbon. That's the most impactful way, the the most economic way to take the most carbon out of the system. As, as soon as possible. And you're not picking winners and losers if you go with an economy-wide price on carbon. You need to combine that, of course, with a very effective uh, carbon accounting framework and, and disclosure requirements. Not overdoing that, but you need, you need the right structure in place. So that's the second one, policy and some of the carbon accounting. And, and the last one is it's not, um, and this goes back to the messaging and it's certainly related to policy. It's not just a national you know, federal, congressional uh, issue, broad tax incentives and the like, very important. But it's, there's a lot of local work that has to be done. When we actually go out and build CCUS projects, we build pipeline to move hydro, pipelines to move hydrogen around or other hydrogen production facilities, uh, renewable fuels facilities. It's sometimes difficult to get uh, things lined up locally uh, in order to get the permitting that we need. And there's a kind of a mix of, diff, of different regulatory environments, which makes it very complicated and can extend the timeline to get these things done. I'm, I'm very optimistic, but I, I, I'll be honest, I'm increasingly concerned that uh, that sound, clear policy will become a bottleneck here. You can see industry is building the pieces out, the foundation out to really start to scale these businesses. I, I don't wanna to get to a point where we're waiting to make sure we have some of that policy certainty before we can actually start building these uh, th these projects. All this is complicated, uh, but I think we all share similar interests around climate change and its impacts. Uh, we all have the same sense of urgency on this. We certainly have that inside of the company. And, and I think we all recognize the broader benefits uh, to the country as a whole in terms of job creation, competitiveness, you know, innovation, and, and ultimately I mean, energy uh, security. So. A lot to unpack there, Marty, but uh, some of our some of our views on on, on in this space. Now that's really helpful. I think kind of confirms the idea that we've got to have some clarity here. That that um, you know fr from a policy standpoint. I mean, I think the fact is, you know, we know we, we're going to have to be able to uh, help accelerate the the energy transition. I mean, investments are being made now. You know, by the private sector. These are not things you're going to like suddenly turn around and. Uh, you know, go the other direction. So what do we do to help facilitate that? At the same time, we've got to be able to focus on on the uh, energy security needs that we have today and that are, you know, we need to help provide to, to the rest of the world. But your, your, your comments on the permitting side are kind of a good uh, segue into an area I wanted to touch on. And that's the you know, kind of compatibility with existing natural gas infrastructure or the transition of that infrastructure and natural gas to help as we get into to a hydrogen economy. Um, so we were looking at the, you know, the current build out of infrastructure to address energy security vulnerabilities that are being planned uh, and long term conversion. Um, uh, I, I guess you give us Chevron's perspective on, on, on this from both the short term need to alleviate infrastructure bottlenecks, as you were, as you were kind of describing, but also the long term compatibility with hydrogen. That's a a, a big, big issue we hear hear more and more about, and uh, and what can the federal government do to help facilitate a hydrogen-ready infrastructure? 
Yeah, and so and you just highlighted, Marty, the the need. There's three things we need with energy. We need it to be cleaner um, and, and lower have a lower carbon intensity, but we also need it to be reliable and affordable. And and that's never been more true than what we're seeing in the markets today. Now, that's a unique set of, of circumstances. Um, but still, you know, these unique types of circumstances tend to, to, to appear and reappear, um, you know, in cycles over over time. So when, when we hinder uh, or, or in some cases, you know, you know, impede infrastructure development in the existing energy system, we in sometimes to try to force uh, an energy transition, it actually works against all three of those goals, re reliability, affordability and cleaner energy. Uh, because, you know, many times the product still finds its way to the market, uh, but in a more expensive, less reliable way. And there are many examples of, of where we've seen that. And then the worst case is when, when that demand or supply shock occurs, and again, these occur regularly, uh, you, can, you, you can face an energy crisis. And we're facing some pieces of that um, certainly right, right now. You know, for, for hydrogen, uh, the biggest, I said it before, the biggest enabler for developing a hydrogen economy and system is exactly that. It's developing the economy and the system. It's more about, in my opinion, the infrastructure uh, to lower the end use cost to consumers and customers than it is the technological advancements. The tech advancements you know, are important and we're working very hard on those. How you store and transport hydrogen are at the top of the list, but building this to scale making the investments that are required to, to move this around cost, move hydrogen around cost effectively, not just produce it, uh, but create the system are, are, are more important in, in my opinion. This is, this is enormous investment, requires enormous investment. Building new gas infrastructure like in Europe, uh, which can eventually be repurposed, can, can make sense. And obviously Europe's in a unique um, set of circumstances currently, but using the existing natural gas infrastructure that we have in this country uh, to move hydrogen, which will require additional investment, makes a ton of sense uh, economically. And, and, and really the most effective way to progress the hydrogen economy soonest is to use existing natural gas resources and infrastructure combined with carbon capture. And I highlighted an opportunity we're working on in the Gulf Coast to produce low carbon hydrogen. You know, the U.S. is blessed with abundant natural gas resources. We have the most advanced natural gas uh, infrastructure. It's massive infrastructure that's taken many, many decades uh, to build than anywhere uh, in, in the world. And this infrastructure is already pointed to large industrial centers and all the way to consumers and, and even um, to international markets, if you think about LNG um, exports. So using existing natural gas to produce low carbon hydrogen and to, to develop the system, which eventually can become even, you know, increasingly lower carbon is, is honestly the, the way to go. Federal government's working on this, right? There, there are very good signs uh, with the infrastructure uh, law, the hydrogen hubs, you know, these CCUS hubs, you talked about the $15 billion in investment. That's a great start, but as I said, we'll need more. And I just caution, I've said this a couple of times against picking two winners and, and, and designating losers being too if we're too specific too narrow too early uh it will take longer for us to to um to solve this this challenge i think natural gas is an excellent bridge to cleaner energy sources especially when you consider the hydrogen potential that natural gas has in and of itself Excellent. Well, as we wrap up here, I just want to, you, you've given us a lot of good things to think about, identify different technologies that Chevron's working on and other things, but being a, a career long creature of Washington, I want to take advantage of your, I'll call real world experience out there. Uh, is there something out there in the clean energy and climate space that you think is underappreciated or that we're not focusing on that you think is, you know, could really help to, to move things forward? I think there's an, I mean, I'll go to a, a higher level. There's there's a long list of uh, technologies that we're looking at, all which have enormous potential. They're not all gonna work, uh, but some of them will, and, and they, they'll be game changers. But I, I think there's an underappreciation, and maybe that's changed a little bit now uh, in the last uh, you know few years as we've gone through COVID and the recovery, and now this, um, uh, you know, what's happening in, in Europe between Russia and, and the Ukraine. Uh, but how large? I think there's an underappreciation of the size and the, comp the complicated nature of the global energy 
system and how challenging this transition is. And I'm not making uh, excuses. I'm not saying this, you know, we need, you know, even more time, uh, you know, or an unreasonable amount of time to solve this, but this is a complicated issue. I am very optimistic that we can solve it, but it requires not only a high sense of urgency, which we, ha we have right now, uh, but an all of the above approach and a different view of partnership. Again, public to public, you know, if you think cross border, public to private and, and with in between private companies, something that we're working very hard on here uh, at Chevron, we have to take partnership to a different level. If we do that, you know, we'll develop the right technologies and the right policies faster. Uh, if we do it separately, it will be much, much um, slower. It's going to take strong leadership. We're absolutely committed um, to do that, to work with anyone uh, on this issue. We are here uh, to help. We are very motivated uh, to work on these things, and we're prepared to invest significant capital to make this a reality. But I think that partnership, Marty, is is really the the, the name of the game here. That's, that's really helpful. Let me one, one final. I want to get one audience question in here too. And you can, as you were talking about investments, I was like, so what? So what are the the potential upsides for the economy and the environment associated with the types of investments that uh, that, that Chevron and, and many of your colleagues are making? I think there's enormous, you know, upside. Obviously, from an environmental standpoint, everything we're working on is to provide cleaner sources of energy, but still do so reliably. Uh, and uh, with affordability, that, that ultimately is uh, you need all three of those to make this to make this a reality. You know, I, I do think another um, under, what folks may underappreciate is the business opportunity here. And I'm not speaking of that just from a Chevron standpoint. Of course, you know, with our uh, shareholders, employees, external stakeholders, uh, we do need to generate attractive returns. And we're focused on doing that. Remember, our objectives are higher returns. And, and lower carbon, but the, the whole world is moving in this direction. The the technological, uh, you know, advancements that we're going to see here, the, the 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 companies that will benefit, you know, from that, not just here within the U.S. and helping to decarbonize the, the United States uh, energy system, but to work on that globally. I mean, that's something that anybody in the United States should be very very uh, excited about. And I think the U.S. honestly has a competitive uh, advantage in this space, in the lower carbon uh, space. We don't have the same challenges that you have uh, in in the European continent um, right now. We, we have abundant natural uh, resources. Um, we've got uh, a system that spurs uh, and uh, encourages innovation and, and development. Uh, we've got uh, one of the best you know political systems, if not the best political system uh, in the world. If we can put all of that together, it sounds very um, maybe idealistic, but I see a an enormous um, uh, business potential, uh, economic potential, uh, not just for companies that are involved in this, but for the country as a whole. Great. Well, Jeff, you've given us a lot, to, a lot of good things to think about and to act on. Uh, so I just want to thank you again for spending so much time with us this morning uh, and look forward to working with you. I understand right. that our technical problems were fixed and we'll, we're now ready to go back to, uh, to Christopher and Brad. So again, thank you, Jeff. Much thank appreciated. You, thank you. My pleasure. All right, fingers crossed. Uh, Mr. Crabtree, yeah. can you hear me? I can. Excellent. All right, let's get on with the uh, the program. So as we just heard, most of today's event is, is really focused on hydrogen, but I'd really like to take advantage of having you here and the breadth of your portfolio at FECM. So let's start by discussing your perspective on the direction of the fossil ener energy and carbon management program that you lead. Um, you were confirmed less than three months ago and are neck deep in the monumental task of bipartisan infrastructure law implementation. Can you take a few minutes and share your major reflections on what is really exciting work underway at DOE during this particular moment in time? And, and really what's your overall vision for FE and what are those priorities over the next six to nine months? Great, thanks Great. Chris. And thanks to you in the chamber for the opportunity to be here. You're right, um, with the infrastructure bill, I had to start off in this job running. Um, one of the things that wasn't as apparent at the time I was nominated um, 
was how both climate and global energy security would converge in such a way. Obviously, energy security has been a priority and uh, of the concern of, of the United States government across administrations over decades. But the Russian invasion of Ukraine has transformed everything. And so uh, the Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management at the Department of Energy actually has, in my view, one of the most important portfolios in the federal government. We have responsibility for economy-wide deployment of carbon management. That's carbon capture. It's direct air capture, capturing CO2 from the atmosphere. It's converting carbon emissions to useful products. It's transporting that CO2 then to places where it can be safely and permanently stored geologically. So there's that what first of the three pillars, which is critical to meeting our climate goals. Uh, Fossil energy and carbon management, this office also has responsibility for the bulk of the programs and funding for natural gas and building a sustainable natural gas supply chain, which obviously following the Russian invasion of Ukraine is of paramount importance. And then equally important and perhaps a little longer term is responsibility for critical minerals. Uh, our country is and our allies are deeply vulnerable in terms of our supplies of critical minerals that are needed for national defense for building the clean energy economy. And it's not only the supply of those minerals, which come primarily from countries like China, Democratic Republic of Congo, and so forth, but the processing of those minerals is also principally located overseas. So these three areas are of, of profound importance and, and also urgency. And so that's that's what we're focused on. But at the same time, we're trying to address all of these things in a way that uh, advances high wage jobs for American workers. Um, we have communities that have experienced pollution for generations. Uh, and so we want to make sure that the investments we're making in these areas are not only solving these problems, but also providing real environmental and economic benefits to to communities and American workers in regions across the country. Um, you know, as far as uh, my particular focus, it is, as you suggested, uh, on the infrastructure bill. Uh, it has to be, in my view, it's one of the most important uh, pieces of energy and climate legislation in my lifetime. And it gives us, uh, I think, an unprecedented opportunity to transform how we produce and use energy in this country. Um, also to put our energy and industrial economy on a real path to net zero emissions by mid-century. But again, as I was just pointing out, the opportunity to make a real difference in the lives of, uh, of Americans and in communities all across this country in energy, industrial and manufacturing regions. Great. Now let's get into some of those specific initiatives that are underway, beginning with CCUS, which you certainly mentioned. And thank you for the context of how critically important what FECM is doing now, um, both for us and the world. Now, the bipartisan infrastructure law provided major investments, um, mm -hmm. historic as it were, as well as specific deadlines and program direction for each letter of the acronym, the capture, the utilization, and the storage. DOE has issued some requests for information and notices of intent as it works towards getting that funding out the door. So a few questions for you. What do you see as the overall status and outlook for those efforts? Um, personally, what has you most excited? Not that you can pick a favorite child. And ultimately, what will successful advancement of the program mean for um, commercialization of CCUS, which has had its share of problems over the years? Yeah, Chris, uh, that's a that's a really good question. Uh, first of all, Marty in his intro earlier was absolutely right about the scale of this. He mentioned you know sixty two billion dollars uh, in the infrastructure bill just for the Department of Energy alone to implement. That's unprecedented. It's historic. Um, in the realm of carbon capture, there is twelve billion dollars to be spent over five years across the value chain of, of, as I mentioned before, capture, uh, carbon removal from, from CO2 from the air, um, carbon conversion, and then again, the infrastructure to transport and geologically store that CO2 is all part of that 12 billion. And then if you look at the investments in hydrogen, 
there are carbon management components to that. And so that $12 billion total actually becomes larger when you include those other things. Um, just quick, some examples of, of those major investments. Uh, I think many of your members may be aware there's over $2 billion from Congress to invest in six large scale commercial demonstrations of carbon capture technology, two for coal fired power plants, two for natural gas power generation, and two for uh, industrial facilities. So when you think about the United States having 12 commercial scale carbon capture facilities operating today, an additional six at large scale is truly transformative and that's just one provision. Um, we're also going to be able to invest on the back end. So historically, we've had to invest in, in funding and tax credits to incentivize the financing of the carbon capture equipment. But now um, we're also able to invest in the infrastructure that all companies and all industries will need to capture and manage their CO2. And that's the CO2 pipelines and other forms of transport and geologic storage sites all over the country. So there's two and a half billion dollars to scale up regional geologic storage so that every region of the country has access to storage opportunities. There's also just over $2 billion for the loan program office at the Department of Energy to invest with industry in the development of large scale CO2 transport infrastructure. And there's three and a half billion dollars for the development of regional, excuse me, regional air cap, direct air capture hubs, which will really put the United States on the front end globally and demonstrating this technology that's so necessary for the future. And of course, you're very focused in, in this session on hydrogen. And of course, there's the $8 billion for the regional hydrogen hubs, uh, which is you know attracting attention and interest all over the country. And you asked me, so what am I most excited about? And you're right, it's not, it's not possible to sort of identify just one or two things. Maybe talk about some themes though. Uh, one is, for the first time in the infrastructure legislation, Congress has, is allowing DOE to invest not just in research and development, but it extend those investments to, to commercial scale demonstration of the technology. I can't tell you how important that is. 20 years ago, when I started working on carbon capture, uh, project developers in the private sector, even then trying to develop these technologies would talk about the valley of death that they developed technologies to the point where they were ready to bring into the marketplace, but then federal support stopped. So this is a huge and really critical change and it's very exciting. Uh, also, for the first time, when you take the provisions of the infrastructure legislation and couple them with the 45Q tax credit, which was reformed and expanded in 2018, carbon capture or carbon management more broadly finally has a level of policy support that is comparable to other low and zero carbon technologies like wind and solar. We've never had that before. And that's that's vitally important. Uh, and then I guess the other thing that I would say that I'm very excited about is a, a hub approach. Uh, one of the major challenges for carbon management is that you have activities and companies all across a value chain and for any part of the value chain to work for a company uh, in that in that segment, everybody else acts, has to act at the same time. So it's not good enough for a company just to capture CO2. They have to have ability to transport it and store it. And if you're a pipeline company, you're not going to be willing to invest in, in a CO2 pipeline if you're not assured there's going to be a supply of CO2 and a permitted geologic storage site to put it in. And the same is true of geologic storage. The, the capture and the transport depends on having that storage site permitted and ready to go. And that's the really exciting thing about the infrastructure bill, whether it's carbon capture, direct air capture, or clean low carbon hydrogen production, there's this integrated hub approach to get us past this chicken and egg problem that you always have with all types of infrastructure. And thank you for hitting on that. That's one of the reasons why we were so supportive of this legislation was making that investment in DOE to get, get over that valley of death. And since, as you mentioned, we're primarily focused on hydrogen and um, you're doing a lot within that space, let's turn to hydrogen. Uh, looking at DOE, there's many, many issues that are cross-cutting and they don't have a single home. And hydrogen is no different. Um, obviously your shop at FECM 
uh, and handles part of it, but you're working with, with EERE's Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Technologies Office, as well as, as you mentioned before, the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations, which will ultimately administer the eight and a half billion for establishing regional hydrogen hubs. Can you really share your thoughts on the coordination between all of these entities within Forestall and the corresponding division of, of labor, but also more broadly, the importance of these efforts to reducing emissions in those hard to abate sectors and ultimately meeting global climate goals? Yeah, so hydrogen, there are many cross-cutting opportunities in the infrastructure bill, but hydrogen is one of the most prominent. And um, we are indeed working very closely across multiple offices at the Department of Energy, Fossil Energy and Carbon Management. The, the office that I lead is coordinating very closely with the Hydrogen and Fuel Cells Technology Office, which is the lead office together with the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations on the implementation side, and of course, the national labs. And uh, as far as the role of fossil energy and carbon management, we're tasked with those pathways for low and zero carbon hydrogen production that involve the use of fossil fuels or biomass, for example, where you are producing hydrogen from those feedstocks and capturing the CO2 that's produced in the process. So even if you're using fossil fuels or biomass, which could normally in, in a combustion setting uh, could lead to uh, CO2 emissions, you're producing the hydrogen and capturing that CO2. So that's the area we focus in. And then within that, within that area, we're, we're working on production uh, the transport infrastructure, which actually is cross-cutting, it's all types of hydrogen, it doesn't matter where it comes from, you still need the ability to transport it uh, safe, safely and cost-effectively. And you also have to be able to store it. And because of the subsurface expertise of this office, we, we are playing a significant role in the bulk storage of hydrogen. And then the final part of this is analytical. We're contributing uh, through the National Energy Technology Laboratory to the technical and economic analyses to help inform how we how we stand up and build out this this clean and low carbon hydrogen economy, and I toward that end I just point out that uh, FECM and the National Energy Technology Laboratory in April released a major analytical effort to support uh, and some of your members may have heard about DOE's hydrogen Earthshot. Um, that was a, that's a commitment and a goal to try to produce. Uh, reduce the cost of clean hydrogen production by 80% to $1 per kilogram within one decade. That's a very ambitious goal. If we can achieve that goal, it will rapidly accelerate the development uh, of a hydrogen economy and its penetration into the larger energy and industrial economy of our country. Um, we also then worked with the other offices to release a notice of intent for the $8 billion hydrogen hubs program. I think Christopher, you also asked me about, you know, hard to decarbonize sectors of the economy and the role hydrogen can play. Uh, just especially in the industrial sector, there are, uh, there are areas where carbon capture is necessary to reduce emissions from the uh, combustion of, of fossil fuels or process emissions that actually CO2 that's generated from the industrial processes themselves, the actual chemistry of the industrial production. Think about cement, um, steel production, certain types of chemical production. Those have CO2 emission streams that don't even relate to energy use. They're all part of the chemistry. But there are other areas where we can literally substitute zero carbon hydrogen for fossil fuels uh, in industrial processes and in uh, combustion. And, and that's a, a really critical opportunity where if carbon capture is not feasible or other strategies like electrification, we can use the hydrogen to directly replace fossil fuels. And sort of also as a feedstock, there, there, hydrogen is a feedstock for many industrial activities. And if we can produce that hydrogen in a low and ultimately zero carbon form, that takes us a big way towards meeting our climate goals. Now, looking a little bit further at the, the, the hubs and what's happening, what is currently happening at the labs, we noticed that DOE's budget request includes a small but important request aimed at developing technologies that really leverage existing natural gas infrastructure, such as pipelines and potentially power plants. This is important as we think about a long-term transition beyond natural gas. 
And we know that the EU is a bit further ahead in thinking about the potential for hydrogen ready infrastructure to facilitate this transition over the long term as they finalized their green taxonomy last week, which specifically calls for high, or supports natural gas infrastructure as hydrogen ready. So what work will DOE be undertaking to advance developments of these tools necessary to ensure the hydrogen compatibility of both existing and future pipeline infrastructure, as well as blending hydrogen into gas turbines for electricity generation? Mm -hmm. Well, so first of all, to your, to your question about the importance of it, um, one of the major challenges to jumpstarting a clean hydrogen economy is that you have to create significant market demand for that hydrogen. And obviously in the near term, over the long term, we're going to bring costs down. Uh, in terms of near zero carbon hydrogen, the most cost effective pathway right now is producing hydrogen, say from natural gas and capturing the CO2. But the, we're making huge investments in hydrogen produced from electrolysis, renewable electricity, nuclear, hydropower, electricity. Uh, which uh, those costs will be brought down as well. But in order to justify those large capital investments in a commodity that will have a higher cost, you have to create demand. And so the ability to put a percentage of, of lower zero carbon hydrogen into the existing natural gas infrastructure is a really critical way to stimulate demand quickly as we start to build out other types of of hydro hydrogen in uses that can further stimulate demand and private sector investment in the technology. So given that fossil energy and carbon management is uh, principally a research and development office at DOE with the Office of uh, Clean Energy Demonstration taking on the commercial scale demonstration component, we're focused on the R&D part of what it's going to take to get hydrogen into the existing natural gas infrastructure. Um, obviously, we have, uh, you know, a diverse infrastructure. Some of it is is aging. Uh, some of it's more modern. There's going to be different considerations. Uh, with 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 uh, hydrogen, you have a particular challenge with hydrogen embrittlement. So pipeline systems and other infrastructure needs you need to have the proper metallurgy to to withstand and resist uh, that that embrittlement. Uh, so that's part of the analysis. You also uh, hydrogen is apt to leakage. And so you have to have detection systems to manage leakage from hydrogen systems as well. All these are you know, important parts of investing in R&D. And I would point out, we need to be able to store hydrogen at scale as well. And that's different than storing CO2. It's a different molecule. And there are geologic storage options and appropriate reservoirs formations for doing that. But it is indeed, we have different than storing CO2 at scale, which we've done, frankly, for decades uh, safely and effectively. Uh, the other part that I think, Chris, you just asked at the end about was turbines. That's, you know, obviously natural gas power generation is a growing component uh, of our larger power generation mix, especially relative to coal-based generation. And the ability to incorporate uh, low and zero carbon hydrogen fuel with natural gas to power those turbines to produce electricity is a great opportunity, again, to stimulate and jumpstart that early demand. So we have made awards through fossil energy and carbon management for uh, different turbine technologies and designs uh, to test and demonstrate their ability to handle uh, varying uh, percentages of hydrogen up to it, including ultimately 100% uh, hydrogen fuel combustion in these turbines. So that's kind of uh, how we're trying to address that need of, of getting a start on the hydrogen economy in the existing system. Well, thank you very much, Assistant Secretary Crabtree. I mean, you have a, a monumental task in front of you we know you're up to it and you should know that the business community will continue to be with you at every turn. Good luck. Thank you, Christopher. And I just wanna thank you and your members for all the support that you provided for carbon management technologies and infrastructure for, for, for many years now. It's, it's, it's uh, really appreciated.
big thanks to Christopher and Assistant Secretary Crabtree for, for a great conversation and, and to Jeff Gustafson and Marty uh, uh, prior to them. Good morning, I'm Dan Byers with the Chambers Global Energy Institute and it's, it's my pleasure to moderate our panel discussion. Uh, we'll, we'll dive a little deeper on, on a lot of the topics where we've been discussing and, and particularly how the business community has, has, has made these really bold commitments in, in to focus on the energy transition. So um, we just heard earlier from, from Chevron. Uh, now we'll hear from, from representatives of two companies as well as uh, fourth largest city in the country on the big bets that they are making on on hydrogen so very much looking forward to this discussion uh quick introductions uh, joining us are jane stricker senior vice president uh, for energy transition and executive director of the houston energy transition initiative a uh, part of the the greater houston partnership uh, one of our, our local chamber affiliate uh, Jane is responsible for leading a coalition of industry, academic, and community partners to ensure the long-term economic competitiveness and advancement of the Houston region towards a more sustainable and net zero emissions future. We also have Bob Wimmer, Director uh, of Energy and Environmental Research at Toyota North America. Bob's an engineer, uh, has an engineering background and leads a team of research engineers assessing how changes in energy and environmental technology, policy and regulation affect the automotive industry. Uh, the group's research areas include petroleum and alternative fuels, advanced vehicle technologies and power generation, and, and perhaps most important, uh, uh, Bob is responsible for, for Toyota's uh, hybrid plug-in electric and fuel cell vehicle external affairs and technical activities. So, so very much at the nexus of, of technology and policy. And, and finally, we have Paul Glazer, Dr. Paul Glazer, a chief engineer for propulsion, power, and thermodynamic systems at GE Research. Uh, Paul works across the full breadth of GE Research's efforts in, in propulsion, power, and emerging technologies. And, and while relatively new to this role, he has served in a number uh, of different capacities with GE over the years, including as a consulting engineer for fuels and emissions, executing engineering aspects of GE's uh, turbine fuel flexibility work and uh, uh, part of the systems engineering team at GE Power. So you can tell we have really uh, uh, broad and deep expertise. Thank you all for joining. Let's go ahead and, and get into uh, the discussion. And, and Jane, we'll go ahead and, and start with you. I think everyone recognizes Houston as the, the oil and gas capital of the world, but maybe, maybe less well appreciated is uh, thanks to your work and that of the Greater Houston Partnership, really that the Houston is poised to lead in, in the energy transition. So please uh, take a few minutes and tell us about uh, the new initiative that you have underway, its, its vision, uh, the consensus building process associated with, with, with developing it and, and, and the role particularly of, of hydrogen and CUS. Thanks, Dan, and, and thanks for inviting me to join this panel. I, I'm super pleased to be here, and it's a great opportunity for us to talk a bit about what what we're doing in Houston uh, in the energy transition. And, and as you said, you know, Houston has always been seen as the oil and gas capital of the world, and really, we're on a mission to uh, to change that image and that perception, uh, and and really have Houston be at the forefront of energy transition and really lead the way to, to low carbon solutions and energy abundancy for the world. And so uh, I joined the partnership in January of this year after a 20 or so year career at BP. Um, and, and I joined specifically to lead this energy transition work and, and lead the Houston Energy Transition Initiative. And, um, you know, I think some people may or may not realize, um, you know, 44 of 128 publicly traded oil and, and gas exploration companies are based here in Houston. We also have 14% of the nation's uh, oil refining capacity, and it and it actually goes up to uh, over 25% when you include some of the um, nearby areas like Beaumont and Corpus and Port Arthur. Uh, and we all are also home to 44% of the petrochemical manufacturing capacity. And so, I think you know, recognizing that Houston really is the epicenter of a lot of energy activity. Uh, this Houston Energy Transition Initiative was really brought together to, to take advantage of the opportunity and the responsibility that Houston has in leading that energy transition and moving the world forward towards a low carbon future. And so we brought together um, uh, roughly 20 different companies from across 
the entire energy value chain. So representing not only oil and gas, but renewables, as well as infrastructure uh, and, and the pet chems industry. And, and really to think about how do we take advantage of this opportunity and how do we make sure that through this transition, um, we are continuing to create great opportunity for Houston and leverage the, the energy leadership that already exists here. And so within that, as you would imagine, technologies like CCUS and hydrogen development are really critical to, to what we see as the big opportunities uh, for Houston to take a leadership role in the transition. Given the size and, and scale of the energy industry that's here, as well as the, the size and scale of the industrial emissions that come along with that, um, and then couple that with the technology that exists today, the technology that's in development in the industry, as well as the infrastructure that we already have. Houston is home to the vast majority of not only CO2 pipelines, but uh, hydrogen pipelines. And Houston already produces a third of, of the nation's hydrogen. So we're sort of in this um, perfect storm of all of the right resources, capabilities, and infrastructure coming together. And so, um, you know, really working with all the industry players to think about how do we leverage these strengths that we have to take advantage of the opportunity and really grow low carbon solutions like carbon capture use and storage and hydrogen in this market to achieve not only our energy goals, but our emissions reduction goals. Thank you for that. That's it is really an impressive effort, and and sometimes we know the consensus building process is not easy. So uh, the fact you're able to get there and have kind of that long term uh, forward vision for the city is is really something else. Uh, let's let's bring in in Bob. Um, hydrogen, I think for those of us in D.C., it's been about maybe two years or so where it's making headlines and attracting attention. But I know at Toyota, it has been. Uh, part of your uh, business plan and technology outlook for for a long time. So please give us an overview of why it's always been a priority of Toyota and, and what it means to the uh, company's climate emissions goals. And then maybe also uh, talk a little bit about the, the, the unique uh, characteristics of hydrogen that, that make it uh, well suited for uh, vehicles, light duty and, and heavy duty alike, because we we certainly all know about battery battery electric applications, but, but hydrogen is, is occasionally forgotten when we think about the, the transition to uh, ZEV uh, transportation. Okay, thanks, Dan. Um, I also like to thank uh, the chamber for inviting me to be here today. Um, but, but for those of us that have been in DC a long time, hydrogen actually, they really began talking about it back in the Bush administration. I believe some of our competitors expected to commercialize the technology in, in light duty vehicles back in 2010. So um, it's taken a little longer than that, but uh, you know, I, I think it's it's like so many other things in town that it tends to be on a, uh, talked about on a cyclic basis. So I just want to start that Toyota is all in on electric vehicle electrification, but it, that's just not battery electric vehicles, but a portfolio including hybrid, plug-in hybrid, battery electric, and of course, what we're here today to talk about hydrogen and, and fuel cell electric vehicles. And really, the, the reason is quite simple. When you sell 15 million vehicles a year as an industry, um, car owners, of course, are going to have different transportation needs and desires. Range, performance, ability to refuel quickly, trailer towing, commuting, they all require different uh, powertrain solutions and, of course, different price points. And what we've concluded is that there's no silver bullet electric powertrain that meets all these applications. Another factor that can't be overlooked is where people live. Approximately 80% of the charging is currently done at home, but only a third to half the households can charge at home. The rest require some sort of public refueling infrastructure. Of course, we have gasoline, we're going to have hydrogen infrastructure, but we also have to have a charging infrastructure for these vehicles. For these reasons, Toyota is really taking a or is taking a portfolio approach to vehicle electrification and has has on the market today all those four technologies that I mentioned before. But of course, we're here to talk about hydrogen and fuel cell electric vehicles. So let me just spend a few minutes touching on what we're doing in that space and why it's important to us. So in 2015, we introduced the fuel cell Mirai sedan. That was the first 
um, fuel cell vehicle available to the general public in large numbers. Since then, we've sold over 10,000 of these vehicles in California and 15,000 of them globally. The current generation Mirai has a 400 mile range and can be refueled in three to five minutes with a dispenser that's very similar to a gasoline nozzle that we all use on a regular basis. The infrastructure is growing in California. There's currently 58 hydrogen stations that are open 24 seven in the state with a plan and much of the funding to reach the state's 200 station target. In addition to the range and rapid refueling, fuel cell vehicles have another attribute that sets them apart from battery electric vehicles. First, fast refueling has no effect on component life. This is a serious concern for battery electric vehicles and something that the industry is trying to resolve, but we still aren't quite there yet. And also fuel cell vehicles use different materials than most batteries. And those materials currently don't have the supply chain issues that battery materials are currently um, experiencing. We expect that to continue into the future as a lot of the materials are, pardon me, most of the materials in fuel cells are precious metals and standard materials that tend to have a different supply chain than those used for batteries. Finally, I'd like to address a myth that fast chargers are less capital intensive than hydrogen stations with this simple example. A single hydrogen nozzle can dispense five kilograms of hydrogen in five minutes. That'll give a Mirai a 400 mile range and a equivalent amount of range from a fast charger in an appropriately designed vehicle plug-in vehicle would take about an hour. That difference requires 10 fast chargers for every hydrogen dispenser, resulting in a very similar station cost. But ultimately, any vehicle technology, the success of any vehicle technology comes down to meeting customer needs. Toyota believes hydrogen fuel cell vehicles are the best ZEV option for a significant number of customers. Not all, but a significant number of our customers. And we will continue to enhance and expand the technology to meet our customers' needs. Well, thanks for that and, and, and some great points, certainly, as you look at consumer polling on, on EV adoption and, and can see that the uh, uh, charge time is a, and range are both um, uh, issues that make some consumers hesitant. And I, I'm not brown nosing, but we are, we are a Toyota family, got two Highlanders in the uh, in the driveway, and I know when I when I fill up uh, our our Highlander, it goes up to I think 375 miles on a full tank. So a 400 mile range for 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 hydrogen vehicle is is really impressive, and I'm, I'm sure it makes a difference. Paul, are, let's, are they are they hybrid? Highlander? Yeah, it's the one of them is hybrid, and one one of them isn't. So the the, the one that gets 375 is is hybrid. Yes, we love Great. it. Um, uh, Paul, let's bring you in. Uh, and GE is obviously a very very diverse company. You, even within its uh, energy business, you have uh, support for renewables, uh, natural gas, energy infrastructure, aviation fuels, and, and more. You also have very ambitious uh, climate goals with hydrogen CCUS at the center of them. Just please give us an overview of, of those uh, goals, your approach to the transition, and, and particularly uh, focus on hydrogen CCUS. Absolutely. Um, first, thanks very much for inviting me and and GE to this panel. Um, you know, I, I have privileged position of being at the research arm of General Electric, where we work with all the different businesses, with all our different customers, both in the United States and around the planet. Um, I was very heartened by Assistant Secretary Crabtree's comments about, you know, how, what we need to do um, and how we need to get there. Uh, GE, you know, we are a you know more than 125 year old company. We love understanding how the future of energy, the future of flight um, looks right now. Some of the ex very exciting things that we're doing on hydrogen is bringing gas turbine technology to our hydrogen uh, customers. Our customers tend to be you know, both technically and strategically astute. They understand that there's going to be a progression up the, the availability of hydrogen as they work to achieve their decarbonization goals. And we're working with them every day to make sure they can achieve them. We've got demonstrations that are at parity with the availability of hydrogen for our large scale utility customers. Uh, we've, we announced them uh, you know, at, at an increasingly, uh, I'd say, frequent clip these days. Last year, we brought hydrogen technology to our exciting new HA class turbine. These are 300 megawatt gas turbine units in a combined cycle operation 
that can use, uh, you know, right now, the demonstration showed that they could burn 5% hydrogen, and that wasn't limited by the actual combustion system. That was simply limited by the amount of hydrogen they had available for the test. So as our customers um, at every scale, using every part of our technology base, increase their uh, connection to their decarbonized future by making green and decarbonized fuels available, we are bringing technologies to them. And with the support of the DOE, we're also pushing the boundaries every day. All right, we've recently announced some very exciting uh, DOE funded exercises to bring 100% hydrogen capability to some of our most advanced, our cleanest, our most high output, uh, highest T exhaust uh, technologies to the market in a, in a few years and do those demonstrations and make them available. So part of both at combustion sciences, what we handle and research, understanding how these work at the component level and bringing the products to our customers uh, as they want to do their demonstrations is a great part of the energy transition. Uh, in terms of decarbonization, we've announced uh, collaborations to do uh, engineering studies with customers like Southern, uh, understanding how decarbonization technologies that are ready to deploy in some sense today uh, will operate on scale so they can achieve their decarbonization goals downstream, understanding what happens to that carbon that is formed. The importance of rotating turbo machinery in the energy transition cannot be understated. Okay. A, you can, we have renewable assets and we believe in them. We're going to continue to help their penetration to the market at every level, but there is very, there's great importance in making sure that these gas turbines with their rotating generators that are on the grid today remain in place and remain available to stabilize the grid and provide both the redundancy or more importantly, the resiliency that our customers and you know the people who actually want their lights to turn on on the hottest day of the year and make sure their houses stay warm in the polar vortex, making sure that level of infrastructure resiliency remains in place. Back to the carbon management, um, we're taking the carbon management of gas turbine assets uh, very seriously. We've got programs available on both the materials and the engineering part using uh, solvents, sorbents, everything that we can. It takes a very broad approach that we're that GE is happy to um, engage with. And we're doing this not just for the energy transition, okay? We're also looking at the, how do we decarbonize sectors like flight? Okay, you know, when people always talk about the few, flight as being a particularly difficult sector to decarbonize. Uh, GE Aviation is both looking at hydrogen for fuels, uh, hydrogen for flight, and some of our customers in Europe are leading the way there, and we're happy to bring our engine and combustion technologies to hydrogen-powered flight. What might that look like? What are the boundaries? Uh, and as well as the f engines that we're selling today, building in the United States, uh, that are flying on synthetic or sustainable, actually, aviation fuels. One of the biggest planes that uh, on the planet, the 777X, flying on GE engines, just flew to a major international air show on a blend of synthetic avi or sustainable aviation fuel. And we continue to do our demonstrations with that. So we understand that as a big US-based multinational company with customers that are, um, I'd say both, you know, invested in our technology and their own, as well as having increasingly important climate and sustainability goals. GE is there to bring the technology that we know how to do, to bring it to market, make sure it is as reliable, safe, and affordable as our customers need it to be. Um, you know, every day I come into work, um, and I t I, I'm always amazed and inspired by all the different stuff that GE is touching. Because if you look around, the number of uh, flights that take off with GE engines and the number of gas turbine assets that we uh, both deliver and supply every day, every one of them is going to need to be in some way part of the both the future of flight, energy transition, what does a decarbonized future look like, both in an incremental way, what are we going to do for the next 10 years, okay, and what are we going to do beyond that when we're talking about really disruptive technologies that get us to the true zero decarbonized future to get the curve down uh, in decades to come. Um, and I just, you know, I, <laughs> if this were a three-hour seminar, I could tell you everything that we're doing, and I'd love to share more. Uh, but I think to answer your question, there's just bringing what we need, all the technologies that Assistant Secretary Crabtree talked about, hydrogen decarb, we are part of them. We're happy to be a partner with them, both with the, the government, the department, and our customers who are ready to use them and conduct the demonstrations they need to meet their goals. Fantastic. And I, I, I would probably like to go three hours uh, as well. I don't know know how much audience we'd have have left at the end, but that really exciting work. And, and particularly, I think aviation is maybe the hardest to abate of all the hard to abate sectors. So that's exciting to hear. And, and, and I'll just also add, I know from our, our utility members that are looking 
uh, and how they're going to meet their goals. A lot of excitement and interest in in the hydrogen blending up to up to 100% for combustion turbines in the future. So, Jane, let, let's come back to you and, and talk a little bit about infrastructure and workforce issues, uh, both of which maybe sometimes get a little bit overlooked. And, and I know you mentioned uh, the great stat that that Houston already. Uh, uh, consumes one third of, of the hydrogen in the country. So I guess in that sense, maybe it is already a, a bit of a hydrogen hub. Um, could you just elaborate on the importance of having infrastructure in place as well as the, the skilled technical workforce and in, in, as we think about sort of cultivating the long-term uh, hydrogen economy? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Dan. I think, you know, one of the, the big advantages that we have in Houston as we think about, you know, opportunities like, um, clean energy clusters and hydrogen hubs and, and you know, in, in a lot of the technologies and solutions that, that Secretary Crabtree mentioned, you know, I think Houston is such a perfect location because we are sort of at the intersection of all of these things. We already do a lot of industrial activity. We have a fair amount of, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the operations along the ship channel. Um, we have the geology. We have the uh, the industry that's already here. We have a, a significant hydrogen industry that is already here. Uh, we have the infrastructure that that, to a certain extent, obviously a, a lot more infrastructure is needed. But but we have a good start to the infrastructure here in the region, um, and and we also have a very technically capable workforce. Uh, and so when you think about uh, the transfer of skills from existing industry into new industries. I think this is again an area where we can leverage our existing energy industry leadership. A lot of the same uh, technical skills that will be required through the energy transition are skills that that exist in the engineering programs and the geology programs and, and in a lot of the, um, the traditional energy uh, skill sets. But um, but we're also looking at how do we set our universities and institutions up to to prepare the workforce for the future. And so, you know, obviously our our perspective at the Greater Houston Partnership and in, in, in Hedy is looking at this as how do we continue to create great economic opportunity and growth for this region and, and workforce development and infrastructure are key to our success in that pathway. And so, um, you know, working with the universities here in the region, particularly, uh, you know, University of Houston has just set up their Energy Transition Institute. Um, we've got the Baker Institute at Rice University. We've got Texas A&M. We've got University of Texas, and then we've got a broad range of um, of other universities that are here as well: Prairie View A&M, um, Texas uh, Southern University, and then and then a broad range of um, smaller institutions all that really understand how critical this industry is to the economy in this region and to thinking about how do we make sure as we are thinking about the um, the demands uh, for CCUSN hydrogen specifically and for other decarbonization solutions, how do we prepare um, students and entrepreneurs for that workforce for the future? And so uh, supporting that growth and development in this region is really, really important. And, and we're seeing more and more um, industry, traditional energy industry players partnering with universities to develop those programs and think about what is that workforce that will be needed in the future. And then, you know, I think we're starting already to see project announcements and, and public-private partnerships and organizations coming together um, to, to develop projects and, and opportunities around both CCUS and hydrogen development and, and um, in partnership to, to move those projects forward. Uh, and, and I'll just mention that, you know, one of the big pieces of work that we've undertaken recently here at Partnership and Hedy is developing this uh, roadmap for a clean hydrogen uh, future for Houston. And, and Houston really is the epicenter of that global clean hydrogen hub um, and so we've brought together over a hundred different organizations to participate in, in the development of that roadmap and really understanding, you know, where are we today? How do we start to transition that to achieve those goals, um, you know, of long-term clean hydrogen development? Uh, and how do we leverage the, the, the existing infrastructure and resources that we have today to set ourselves up for success in the future? And so I think, you know, 
we see hydrogen and CCUS as being very closely linked, particularly in this region, because it really gives us the opportunity to address two emission sources at the same time. If we can eliminate the emissions associated with the production of hydrogen, as well as then use that hydrogen to eliminate the production of, of CO2 emissions in, in the, the industrial processes, then we've sort of uh, doubled up on our ability to meet our emissions goals. And so that's really where we see the, the biggest opportunity here in Houston. Thank you for that, and, and, and really hard to to overstate the, the the importance of that workforce. And as we know, we see from polling of uh, the younger generation, college graduates are really eager to to be part of the solution on climate and energy. And so the fact that you have that uh, that base of of a academic programs for them to to transition into is really important. I want to just flag we we could go we could go long, uh, but I want to be cognizant of the time, but also invite. Uh, audience, if you if you would like to ask some questions, we'll do our best to try to fit them in here in our in our final ten or fifteen minutes or so. So feel free to enter them into the chat. Uh, Bob, I want to come back to you though and and uh, ask about uh, Toyota's work in Southern California and particularly the the ports of of Los Angeles and, and Long Beach. I think most folks are aware that uh, Southern California has has some really bad air quality uh, challenges and has for a really long time. Transportation is a major, major driver. It's not easy to um, address that overnight, but you all have a really, I think, exciting and interesting um, uh, a partnership underway uh, that, that doesn't just uh, reduce GHG emissions, but helps to uh, address ozone, particulate matter, et cetera, that, that Southern California is dealing with. So please go ahead and, and tell us about that. Yeah, Dan, we're really excited about our activities in Southern California. Um, it's always great to get um, wheels on the ground and, and get out of the test, you know, out of the lab and, and actually start, uh, you know, testing vehicles. And what we're trying to do is, is demonstrate the scalability and zero emission benefit of, of, fuel, of our fuel cell power module in applications beyond the, the light duty sedan that I talked about earlier. So one of these projects is um, in Class 8 uh, trucks hauling drayage, as, as Dan mentioned, at the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles. And drayage is those cargo containers that come off ships. Typically, they get either hauled from the port to a railhead to transport in other parts of the country, or as we were primarily doing in Southern California, is trans transitioning the, the um, containers to local businesses around the L.A. basin. So what we've done there is we've taken a standard Kenworth chassis, and retrofitted it with two of our fuel cell system modules from the Mirai. So basically two of the, the power plants that are under the hood of the Mirai. We've added six hydrogen storage cylinders, a small hybrid battery pack, and, and included an electric drivetrain. And this combination is shown to uh, have better performance than conventional diesel. I guess there's videos out there of a drag race with the diesel truck that, that the fuel cell truck easily wins. And um, full, at, at a full load range of over 300 plus miles, which is completely sufficient for, for daily operation in that type of um, drayage service. The 18 month demonstration has been basically a huge success because it's allowed us to test over a dozen different trucks with different design iterations on a daily basis in real world use. And another benefit that we find is, is really important is getting feedback from partners who operated these vehicles, in some cases, eight to 10 hours a day, six days a week. That really gets put back into the design process on how we update and improve the technology. Um, but for me, the, the true value of these trucks is, is the health benefits they provide to those living communities near where they operate. As mentioned, they're, they're zero emission vehicles, so they emit no particular or NOx emissions, uh, which we all know is, is detrimental to human health. And if you've seen um, some of the recent news reports, the trucks lined up to the port, basically in the middle of a, a residential area, it's just, you know, uh, you, you, you see the value of, of doing this and, and we are all in on, on trying to help um, you know, address some of these the environmental issues. In addition to the Class 8 truck program I was just mentioning, we're demonstrating our fuel cell module in various medium duty and industrial vehicles. 
as well as we've we've done a number of stationary power plants. One is in operation in, in California today. Um, these these demonstrations, along with our market research, has really convinced us that there's a growing need for all types of zero emission power generation. And to meet this, um, Toyota is going to begin assembling these fuel cell modules in our Kentucky manufacturing plant next year. So that's just a quick overview of some of the activities we were doing in um, Southern California, Dan. So I'll pass it back to you. Well, thanks for that. And I, I couldn't agree more with the with the port project. It is really exciting and, and probably more so than the GHG emissions reductions. There, there's environmental justice issues. And we had a had a chance to see a demo of one of these trucks that came to Capitol Hill and it's neat. There's no exhaust and the, just have a little bit of water that drips out and, and otherwise completely clean. Paul, uh, we'll turn to you uh, and and sort of being cognizant of time, ask you, Christopher mentioned earlier uh, about choosing your favorite children. I'm sure you have a long list of, of, of GE projects that maybe you could cite, but could you just maybe mention um, two or three that you think are most interesting and, and, and exciting for the company uh, looking forward? Well, um, you're right. It is very difficult to choose children, especially when you live in such a big family as GE Research, because we see it all. Um, I would say in terms of the technical, um, the mixture of technical challenge and potential impact uh, and the long-term nature of it, I think some of our exercises to bring our most advanced combustion technology to true 100% combustion. Uh, these are efforts going to be funded by the Department of Energy um, soon. Um, we are, these are our awards. Um, it, this is going to be a great project, right? Because people talk about from a fundamental combustion science project, people talk about blends and the incremental nature of it, which we know we can do, we can deliver that today. But if we look at the distant future, not distant future, but maybe a decade or two out, the requirement to truly burn 100% and make low emissions technology with the reactive nature of hydrogen fuel addressing all the things that assistant secretary crabtree talked about the metallurgy the fact that it's a more reactive fuel with engineering challenges at every level solving that problem is going to be very exciting we're going to learn a lot doing it and we can't wait to bring it to our customers and the other i'd think the the fact that we can i'd say burn 100 percent SAF and any approved SAF, i guess uh, sustainable aviation fuel in all of our engines today we kind of got that box checked. You know, we're waiting for those supplies to increase. Uh, so any engine that we sell today, or the, that's going to fly you back and forth to your next vacation, it, it it can run on any one of the ASTM approved SAFs out there. Um, you know, either in most of these are blends right now, and we're looking to expanding the nature of the approved fuel base, uh, both in supply and number of fuels that are approved. So we're looking forward to increasing that so the engines that we've got can continue to fly using decarbonized fuels for years to come. Um, those are, I think, two projects I want to highlight right now. And a lot of the other things that we're talking about in terms of new wind turbines, bringing our larger turbines, our offshore units to the market, that's going to have a huge impact when people need large amounts of megawatts in the right area. And the fact that we can ship them around the world so a U.S.-based company can influence decarbonization and the, you know, the future of energy around the planet, uh, that is an also very exciting time to be part of GE. Uh, it's a reason to be you know, excited about coming to work every day here. Thanks. Uh, a lot of great opportunities there. I'm watching the clock. Uh, maybe it, I would ask you all to just take a minute. We haven't talked as much about policy, and, and, and that's fine. But if, if you could each we'll go around, we have a, a question in the chat to this effect. Effectively, um, what would you like to see Congress and the executive branch focus on in order to sort of strengthen the policy environment to foster acceleration and, um, of, of uh, investment? for your companies uh, in, in hydrogen and CCUS. Paul, why don't we, we stay with you and then and sure. go to the others? Um, hopefully my comments will not be you know strange to anybody, but Secretary Crabtree talked about this, helping our customers get over the valley of death. Absolutely critical because we are a large infrastructure company and the projects and the products that we build are large. Okay, we need the availability and support of the government at every level to make sure that when we have technologies that we believe can work, getting them reduced to practical demonstrations at scale requires the help of a, of a government who believes in the long-term promise of the affair. So we need Department of Energy and all the federal agencies to believe in the, the, the future of decarbonization, the future of, of the energy transition by helping us get over this valley of death by facilitating these large de scale demonstrations, um, making sure that the fuels we need are ready to go, the, 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 
the scale and the fi financing is there. And the other thing I would say is a very durable, clear eyed view with an eye towards the future on things like the 45Q tax credit, production tax credit for wind turbines, and the understanding that the policies that we depend on to ensure that GE and other companies who are involved in the energy transition remain globally competitive, that these the sort of the economic realities are, uh, I'd say, favorable enough to shepherd these things through the decades that, to come to get them to market. So keeping your eye on the long game and helping our customers get over the valley of death are two things I would ask both the executive and the legislature branch to sort of to maintain and deliver. Thanks. And, and glad you mentioned the word durability and, and also 45Q, which we're big champions of. Bob, let's go to you. So uh, when we look at the global situation, California is is leading when it comes to to hydrogen and, and fuel cell vehicles. So we really look to them as giving us a sense of what policies have been successful out there. And we're we're trying to advocate those policies on within other states as well as on the federal level. And I'll just go through our sort of laundry list of, of policies and, and regulations that we think would be most helpful. Um, on the production side for the hydrogen, low carbon fuel standard is 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 great to incent production of low CI fuels, not just hydrogen, but all low CI fuels. California has a, a strong one. State of Washington has has um, is working on uh, another one. Uh, a consistent source of funds for infrastructure development in California, they use their cap and trade program in other states or on a federal level, there would be other opportunities to have that source of funds. And that's really to assure that when you're a manufacturer, vehicle manufacturer, station developer, you know those, that support's going to be around more than two or four years. Um, finally, to create an um, investment tax credit to incent hydrogen production distribution as well as station development. It's worked in the solar industry. It's worked in the, the wind industry. We think it would uh, be appropriate and, and successful in the, the hydrogen industry as well. On the vehicle side, there's a, currently a federal fuel cell vehicle tax credit that needs a couple of tweaks. One is a long-term extension, so we're not trying to get it renewed every year. Maybe five or 10 years would be very helpful for um, industry certainty. It also needs an increase in the amount of incentive for medium and heavy duty vehicles to basically provide meaningful support. The current levels are so low, nobody is, is helped by it. And then finally to at least either eliminate or suspend the 12% federal vehicle excise tax on medium and heavy duty trucks. That should really be, as I said, suspended or uh, eliminated for, for ZEV medium and heavy duty vehicles. So that's sort of the rapid fire um, policies that we'd like to see uh, moving forward. Good stuff. I got five of them there. So that's a that's a that's a long list of work for Congress. Jane, we're going to give you the last word. Fantastic. Thanks. And I'll just echo, uh, you know, obviously a, a lot of the same things that have already been said. But I think, you know, for me, the keys and I think for our for our member companies, the keys are around a durable regulatory framework, both for hydrogen and and CCUS at both the state and federal level. And so having consistency across is, is really important and with particular focus on permitting and siting of both hydrogen infrastructure as well as um, CO2 pipeline infrastructure, as well as the asset, uh, the production facilities that will be needed. And then clarity on key uh, you, uh, CCUS regulatory policies like class six permitting uh, and primacy and long-term liability. I think all of these are things that are um, sort of the, the hurdles that we need to be able to overcome to see real projects get underway. Obviously, um, you know, 45Q and, and tax credits of, of that sort are really important in, in terms of being able to uh, achieve scale of, of these types of projects. But I think, uh, you know, in the near term, there are some key regulatory issues that we, we need to be able to get over that hurdle in order to really see some projects start to come together. And I think the sooner we can land on those items, uh, the sooner we'll actually see steel on the ground and, and be able to see projects come together and, and see the impact of all of these opportunities. Thank you. Uh, well, we certainly, I think we have our work cut out for us on the policy side. There's lots of great suggestions there. It's been a fantastic discussion. I think we could have gone, gone a lot longer, but uh, I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, and I want to turn it over to uh, Marty Durbin for closing comments. So thank you all again.
Thank you, Dan. And let me just th thank all of our speakers today. It was a really great conversation we had. It really highlighted both the, you know, the, the, the leading role private sector is taking in making these investments for the energy transition, uh, but the importance of this partnership with, uh, with government to help us get there. So I want to thank all of you for joining us for the conversation. And, and please be on the lookout for, uh, for notices for what our next conversation and what energy innovates and how the innovation is driving our energy future. So thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day.